welcome to the third session of the Grace Intention Catholic Mom Advent Book Club. I am thrilled you are here. Um, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you've been with us the past two weeks, welcome back. I'm thrilled you came back. Um, there is a chat box at the bottom and I would love to have people drop in the chat box uh, their name, where they're from, a quick hello. It's always nice to know there's someone on the other side of that screen. Um, I am Claire McGarry and I want to thank Catholic Mom for extending this invitation to me. I feel very blessed uh, to be part of that writing community and to receive this information, so thank you. Um, for those of you who this is your first time, there might be some glitches. Um, there's some technology problems, but if you just rewind, um, you might be a smidge behind, but it will keep the flow smooth uh, and the glitch does not appear in the recorded version. So um, again, my name is Claire McGarry. I am the mom of three children, uh, 17, 15, and 11. I've been married for 20 years. I live in New Hampshire with my husband and kids. And I am the author of Grace Intention, Discover Peace with Martha and Mary. It is available on Amazon. Uh, no need to have purchased it or read it to attend tonight. Uh, but if you are interested, you can find it there or at my publisher, Our Sunday Visitor. Very quick recap of sessions one and two, because I listened to last week's video and realized I talked way too much on the recap. Um, session one, I talked about the three levels of tension, low, mid, and high, as well as the gift method, which is how we work our way through stress and tension when we have it. So gift is an acronym for the G. We gauge where the tension is while we sit at the feet of Jesus, working with him to discover the tension. He prompts us to invite it in, so we face it head on. And in doing so, we loosen our hold on the emotions that surround the stress and tension, and they loosen their hold on us. That's when we can use the F, where we can filter through it with God's loving eyes. He always is working for our good. He always sees things with love. And once we can look at things through his filter, that's when he reveals to us what change might need to happen in order for that tension to disappear. It could be an outward change in it, or it could be an inward change. Uh, and the way God communicates with us in the low level tension is through the gentle nudge. When we feel that nudge, it might be that we're doing a good thing for the wrong reason, or we don't have our priorities straight or whatever, he will give us a gentle nudge. And once we respond to that and we align our head with our heart, everything smooths out. And so when Jesus says to Mary, she chose to, to Martha that Mary chose the better part, I believe he wasn't just saying what she chose, but how she chose, that she chose to serve with her whole heart. And so we align our head and our heart with right intention. Session two, we talked about when we don't do that, um, when we resist that gentle nudge and we dig our heels in and we pull that rope of tension, we escalate ourselves into the mid-level zone. So last week we talked about ways to keep that stress and tension at bay. And we talked about drawing healthy boundaries, trimming back the extras, deferring to a different season, and preventing comparison. So now, here we are, week three, and it's time to jump in. Welcome, Jess. So sorry your meeting got canceled, but I am thrilled you are here. Thank you. So let's begin with the prayer. It's the one I've used for the past two weeks. Um, it calls upon the Holy Spirit in the form of a song, which I will not sing for you. I will just pray it. But name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. 
We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So between last week and this week, um, we had a killer lineup. All great, amazing stuff. But believe it or not, I had a Christmas party to attend Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday. And actually, I was hosting two of those four. Um, again, all wonderful reasons to gather with people I love and cherish. And I tried my best to implement everything we talked about last week, uh, drawing healthy boundaries, trimming back the extras, doing things as simply as I could. But after it all was said and done, I was utterly and completely exhausted, which is its own form of stress and tension. So despite implementing the four strategies we talked about last week, it proved to me yet again, there's a reason why there are more chapters to the book. There are more strategies that we need to implement in order to keep that tension at bay. And so that's where we begin tonight, which is chapter seven, asking for help. If we want to place ourselves at the dinner party with Martha and Mary in Luke 10, we all know very clearly that Martha never once turns to Mary and asks for her help. What she wants instead is she wants Mary to get up and do it of her own volition. When that doesn't happen, she goes to Jesus because she wants to demand that Jesus demand that Mary change. So she doesn't ask Mary for help. She goes to Jesus and demands it. Very different things, asking versus, dema versus demanding. So why doesn't Martha ask for help? And I don't know about you, but I've talked in great length how I am very much a Martha, and I very much struggle with asking for help. So why do we do this? There are a slew of reasons, as many as we are, that's as many reasons as there are. We're too proud to admit we can't do it all alone. Oftentimes for me, it's that I'm too controlling. I want everything done my way. So if I do it all myself, I'm certain it's going to be done exactly how I envision it in my head. Sometimes we're too meek. We think we might be inconveniencing people. And oftentimes we're convinced that we're supposed to be able to do it all ourselves. And if we can't, we feel inept. And that's why we have Jesus as our role model. Jesus could do and can do anything, yet he chose to call the disciples to help him. He called them to follow him but he also called them to help him. And he did that while he was still on earth so that he could be available to the disciples when they didn't get the lesson right. So when he sent them out to heal, some came back and said, there was someone with demons in them and we couldn't exercise them. What did we do wrong? They had access to Jesus so they could actually find out what they, how they needed to become more like him. And then after the fact, after Jesus left us, the disciples were the ones who carried on the faith. Um, and the same goes for us. When we ask for help, we empower other people. We provide an opportunity for them to shine. We redistribute the weight. If we're trying to hold up everything under one column of support, picture that visual. Of course, picture, picture a square with four corners and we're on one corner trying to hold the whole structure up. It's just physically impossible. We need to call others to come to us, join us, help us. We need to do it, obviously, with humility, which is another uh, 
positive about asking for help. I think we are meant to be humbled. God didn't create us to do anything alone. And so there's a great gift in admitting that, going to God for his help, going to others to ask for that for theirs. A perfect example is the fourth and final party that we just had was um, every year we do a party, just the five of us, my husband, myself, and our three kids. And usually I orchestrate it from start to finish. I create all the games, I run all the games, I get all the supplies. I'm like a ringmaster for two, three hours as we're all going through these fun Christmas events. I was too exhausted. I didn't have the energy and actually I didn't even have the time to plan the games. And so I humbled myself. I admitted that. And then I asked each person in the house, can you please make up your own game and can you run it? And when I tell you my husband spent over two hours planning his game and preparing for it, it was this Lego game and it was all around building different Christmas objects and running around the house and scavenger hunts. And it was so much fun. And I think my husband was more present at this party than he has been in years past because he was wholly invested in it. Same with my kids. They were running their games. They came from their hearts and their imaginations. And so they were so much more invested. It was one of the most fun parties we've had. And more importantly, my kids were kinder to each other because they knew if they were kind to the person who was running the current game, everybody else would be kind to them when they were running the game because we can get quite competitive. And so sometimes in years past that that competitiveness has had a sharp edge to all of us. And that went by the wayside because everybody was investing themselves and they were using their own gifts and talents. And that's what asking for help does. We tend to untap a wealth of potential in other people if we're not hogging it all to ourselves. So I will put these um, questions up on my blog, um, but I, the questions that we need to think about when we're trying to at, determine how we go about asking for help is what tasks can I ask other people to help me with this advent? And then who are the best people for each one? Those are the questions that if we take them to God, he will reveal what we should be asking for help with and who is the best suited for each task. Okay. Next we have chapter eight, defining priorities. When we don't define priorities for ourselves, we run the enormous risk of getting distracted. We lose our focus of what's important and necessary, and then we start giving importance to mundane tasks that really don't need to get done. Even worse, and I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of procrastination. Because I haven't defined priorities, I can procrastinate and I can just chase random butterflies. Anything that crosses my radar, I get so distracted, I end up doing that not what is actually required for what's about to happen. And then the worst thing of all, time runs out and we feel like we're playing beat the clock. And when that happens, when we feel like there were certain things we were meant to accomplish and the time is running out, and we believe we're going to fail, and we believe we're going to let other people down, and we're going to let ourselves down, that's when worry kicks into gear. And when worry kicks into gear, it completely pulls our focus. When worry and distraction end up feeding each other, we get completely derailed. I don't know about you, but that's when my stress and tension goes through the roof and typically my poor kids end up being the victims of it because I get short tempered. 
Um, I start demanding things that are unrealistic. I start yelling at them. Um, and so it's a very, very important that we define our priorities. And it should be no surprise that our first priority should be God. When we go to him, when we spend time at his feet, he recharges us, he rejuvenates us, he multiplies us. Like the fishes and the loaves, suddenly we have energy. We're not worn down. And there's an ability to see things more clearly. Like a camera where worry takes it out of focus, Connecting with God and recharging with him brings everything into sharp and clear focus. We suddenly recognize what's important and what isn't. And of the what's important, what are the top priorities? And we end up swapping our almighty to-do list for the almighty's to-do list. He knows what needs to get accomplished in our day. He knows what's mat what matters, and he wants to help us with that. And if we spend time with him, he will clarify what we need to do, in what order, and how we need to get it done. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, we, had, we have a new priest, Monsignor Anthony. And we wanted to invite him over for dinner so that we could get to know him better. He could get to know us better. And the way things aligned with the calendar of when he was coming, I won't say it was the worst possible time, but it was an incredibly challenging time. Um, I was extremely busy. I hadn't cleaned the house in ages. Um, you know, the grocery shopping, planning the menu, all of that. And... I suddenly realized there probably couldn't be a more comparable example of having the priest over as it was for Martha entertaining Jesus and the disciples. So it was a very clear connection of, okay, I need to follow my own advice and I need to define what are the top priorities for making this dinner happen and what is my priority in making it happen and so my focus became the table what was the food i was going to put on the table how was i going to make it i had to do the place settings and set the table otherwise there would be nothing to use to eat the meal and more importantly what was the atmosphere i was trying to create around the table because I wanted us all to be welcoming. I wanted us all to be present. I didn't want to be running around the kitchen. I wanted to be seated. And so in defining all of those priorities, God helped me to determine how to accomplish them all. He also helped me keep distraction and worry at bay so that when the doorbell rang, I was ready, I was centered, I was welcoming. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. It's probably the best I have ever had entertaining someone because I clearly and consciously clarified what the priorities were and then leaned on God to help make them happen. So it is possible, I promise, I lived it. So when we're determining how to define our priorities, we go to God and we ask, what are my priorities this Advent? They could be different at another time of year. Clearly something magical or miraculous is happening at this time of year. So what are the priorities around that? How do we remain focused on those priorities? How do we remove the distractions and the worry that keep pulling us away and keep escalating our stress and tension. Okay, next we'll move on to chapter nine, valuing self-care. So they talk a lot about out of the mouths of babes. Well, 
Uh, my daughter Jocelyn isn't a babe, but she's 11, so she's still quite young. And after our four days of parties, we were driving to church on Sunday, and my tank, physical tank, was on empty. And without even my saying anything, Jocelyn said on the drive, um, we need to take better care of ourselves. We, we keep doing what's easy, not necessarily what's right. And it was astounding because she was 100% right. And so the next book that comes out of the McGarry household will probably be written by her, my, my wise and amazing 11 year old. But the question is, why do we always push ourselves so much? Why do we reach the point where we're running on fumes? We know when we fill our car, it now is powered to go. But we also know that when that light is blaring on the dashboard that we're about to run out of gas, we know to stop and refuel, but yet we don't. And I believe Martha didn't either, at least at Luke, in Luke 10 during the dinner party. She goes too far, she tries to do too much until her tank is running on empty too. And inevitably, when we're running on fumes, we crash and burn. And so I believe that what we're doing in this pushing and pushing and pushing ourselves is we're actually breaking the golden rule. We're supposed to love God and love others like we love ourselves. But if we love ourselves, why are we treating ourselves this way? We would never treat God that way. We would never treat the ones we love. And so we have to value self-care. God knows us. He knows us inside and out. He counted the hairs in our head. And he knew that we would try to push ourselves seven days a week. And that's why he created the Sabbath. He created the Sabbath out of love for us creating a space where we could unwind. And as much as there are some rules around the Sabbath, it, more importantly, it's about the gifts that the Sabbath brings. Yes, God wants to spend time with us, and we have to go to his house and spend time in the Mass and honoring and praising him and connecting with him. But then he wants us to do things that restore and rejuvenate. Best of all, he loves when we do things we enjoy that restore and rejuvenate and include him along for the ride. So Jesus role modeled this, not so much in the Sabbath day, but he role modeled the Sabbath moments. We sometimes... Uh, think that we have to carve out 24 hours where all we do is sit around and relax and have our feet up and the other six days we run crazy but Jesus role modeled that we can have Sabbath moments whenever we need them to refuel and rejuvenate he went away to deserted places to pray and reconnect with his father because he is the source of all energy he rested in the backs of boats um, he refueled and refilled all the time in the presence of his father. And so when it comes time for our own Sabbath, whether it's the day or our Sabbath moments, I caution us that we need to be careful that we don't choose activities that are actually escaping. There is a difference between rest and escape. Rest restores and rejuvenates us. Escaping leaves us most times feeling worse off than we did before. Um, an example will be oftentimes I will just dive into mindless television. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think it gives our brains time to rest. However, I take it too far. I watch Netflix and it rolls from one episode into the next episode into the next episode and I end up staying up too late and I'm more exhausted the, the next day than I was 
when I sat down to rest. So we need to be very clear about the difference between rest and escape. Um, in chapter nine, I list a whole bunch of questions that guide us through that. Unfortunately, we're, we don't have a lot of time to delve into those specifics, but it is all there mapped out on how to discern the two. And so questions for reflection on valuing self-care is, where have I been running on fumes this Advent? What can I do to restore? And when can I realistically fit that in? Um, I think sometimes we have lofty ideas of how we're going to rest and rejuvenate and they're, they're actually uh, not realistic for who we are and what's going on in our lives. So we do have to get concrete and realistic. And when we spend time with God, he will reveal what those are, okay? And the last chapter we're gonna cover for tonight is employing self-discipline. Um, we all have lofty plans for overcoming our shortcomings, for all the different ways that we're gonna implement the changes that we're being called to make in order to keep that tension at bay. But there's a difference between a plan and how we execute it, or if we execute it at all. Oftentimes, I am the queen of making the plans, but I never actually carry it out. So we aren't what we plan, we are what we do. And when we don't implement those changes, we're resisting self-control. When we have bad habits, when we are resisting change, we can get stuck in a bad spiral. Almost picture a whirlpool and it picks up speed as it spins. And it's very hard to stop a momentum once it gets going, once it picks up speed. And we see Martha do that at the dinner party. She picks up speed as she's running around the house, getting everything ready for Jesus. Um, and we too, I know I can be like a cyclone when something is about to happen or about to host something. Um, I can be a crazy lady running around like crazy. And so we all know bad habits are hard to break. We all know positive change is difficult, but we want it to be easy. We sit around waiting for the inspiration to change. We reverse it. We think the inspiration and the easy path open up to us, and that's when we're going to change, when in fact it's the exact opposite. Change a positive change only happens after a positive action. So rather than sitting around waiting for inspiration to hit, we actually have to do the hard work of just doing it, <laughs> like the Nike slogan. Um, the positive impact comes after to the decision to make a change. So when we decide to stop the current, when we push back against it, and when we take one step after another toward the positive change that we want to make, that's when the inspiration comes. With each step we take comes the inspiration for the next step, and the next step, and the next step. And we end up creating a wonderful spiral going in the right direction. But it cannot happen until we decide it will happen and take the necessary steps even when it's difficult. And the reason why it was important to end here is because we talked about so many things, so many different strategies and techniques for keeping our stress at bay or for transforming it once it's already hit, unless we actually use self-discipline, 
to carry out those changes, they'll never happen. And so they're all just theories until we do the concrete work of using self-discipline and taking those steps in the right direction. Jesus role modeled it for us all the time. He never went with the flow. He never took the easy route. And as much as we don't want to, we too have to do the hard work. Um, in that chapter in the book, I talk about using math words, but just very quickly, I'll talk about math words are we have to add in what we need. If we decide it's time to make a change, we have to add into our lives what we need to feel supported um, and empowered to make that change. So we need to add in whether it's uh, connecting with people who are doing what we wish we were doing. Anything that you can think of to add into your life that's going to propel you in the right direction. Oftentimes we have to subtract. If we are going in the wrong direction and decide it's time to make a change, I don't mean to say we need to cut everybody out of our lives that's, that continues to go in the wrong direction, but if those people can't support us in our change, or if they're trying to drag us back into the bad behavior and the bad patterns we're trying to get away from, that could be a prompt that it might be time to get some distance. Then we use division. We have to divide our expectations. I don't know about you, but especially with the new year coming, I get all these lofty ideas of all these crazy radical changes I'm going to make. And I'm very pie in the sky about uh, overreaching and that's the number one way to fail is biting off too much expecting too much so God prompts us to divide our expectations to actually match our reality and then last we have to multiply it all by him he knows exactly what we need he knows exactly how to get there and when we lean on him everything all the positive quadruples and just continues to grow so self-discipline is how we put everything we've talked about into action it's the key to it all so questions for reflection when employing self-discipline is what bad patterns have i gotten into this advent how can i go about reversing them and in what other ways do i need to employ self-discipline in order to find peace this Advent. Okay, so again, I'll put up all those questions um, and we will close with a prayer. Good and gracious God, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your only begotten Son to save us. Help us to prepare our hearts for his coming. Inspire us to turn to you in our stress and tension to discover the gifts you've tucked inside. Help us to unwrap them and apply them to our lives so our stress and tension dissolve, leaving room in the inn of our hearts to receive your son. Help us this Advent to ask for help, define our priorities, value self-care, and employ self-discipline. Remind us to always align our heads with our hearts this Advent so every task we carry out becomes a gift we can present to you. We ask this in your son Jesus' name, according to your will. Amen. So, if you're just tuning in or you tuned in late, uh, this is the Advent Book Club, Grace and Tension, Discover Peace with Martha and Mary. Tonight was the last session. If you enjoyed what you heard here and you'd like to explore more, the book is available on Amazon. I'd be honored if you got it. Um, and I also have a blog. It's called ShiftingMyPerspective.com. You can also get there via ClaireMcGarry.com. And on that website, I do have a tab for feedback about the book. I would love to know how it impacts you. Positive or negative, doesn't matter. 
I'm open to learning and growing and seeing how I could have done something differently. I also have a book club tab on there with the previous two sessions, but you can also watch them recorded right here on Catholic Mom Facebook as well as on YouTube. And I would love it if you would follow me. I can be reached at Claire McGarry Writes on Instagram, Claire McGarry 2 on Twitter, and Claire McGarry Author on Facebook. So I'm thrilled that you joined me. I'm honored that you joined me. This is such a busy time of year. I hope that what I shared blesses your advent and graces your life. Okay, Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye.